So we saw now that you know there is an eigenvalue and eigenvector one. The bridge rank equation x bx has a solution. Right? It'll be the solution of the scores. Now, one thing that right seems like I'm almost trying to trick you for now because I argue that when we define that xk needed to be bigger than zero, right? But nothing, you know. Just the fact that one is an eigenvalue of x does not tell me at all that the eigenvector needs to have positive entries, right? We also need the eigenvector x to be to be uh, to be non-negative. Now, indeed, there is something that tells us this, right? This is known as the Perron for being a theorem. I don't want to get into it to prove it. Is. Genius guarantees that. X will be negative entry wise, and therefore that these are scores, right? Because otherwise, the floating negative scores around wouldn't make much sense. Right now, Perron Frobenius, I mean, it's not that hard to show, but in particular, it's quite easy to see if, if the matrix is symmetric. So, most of the course, almost always, the matrix is not going to be symmetric. This is one of the few examples where it's not. And if it's symmetric, then the leading eigenvector will be the one that maximizes the quadratic form, right? And if you're maximizing the quadratic form, you know, if you're trying to maximize something like this, and m as non-negative entries is only positive numbers or zeros, then of course you do not want to have x with entries of x with different signs, right? Otherwise, you're just going to get cancellations that will just make this number lower. So a lot of things in symmetric matrices are much, much easier to see. Right now, I still haven't said everything, right? I still haven't explained why, you know, it could be that there's many solutions to this equation. Right? It could be that there's many solutions and they have different meanings and so on. And indeed, there's sort of issues that might arise. Right? One potential issue is that, let's say, for example, that I have two internets. Right? I have web one and web two, and there's some type of wall behind between them, so the internets can't talk to each other. There's no links in between them. Right? So pages link each other to each one of the internets, but they don't link each other to the other internets. And I claim that there's at least two different solutions to that, right? Or even two, you know, a linear combination of, there's two solutions and then any linear combination of them is a good solution, right? It's not so hard to see. So of course, x equals zero satisfies this. So one thing I could do is just solve page rank on web one and to just put zero on everything on web two, right? It's definitely consistent in web two and in web one. And since there's no interaction between the two, this will, there's no equation that involves the two, this will be fine. I could also do the reverse, right? I could say this solve to zero and solve page rank here. And so I get two different solutions, right? I get two different x's, and any linear combination of them will, of course, be such a, such a solution, right? I mean, another way to say is if the internet looks like this, then, you know, lambda equals one has multiplicity Simplicity two, right? As an eigenvalue, right? As an eigenvalue of b, right? And so there's ways around this. I mean, I don't think the internet actually looks like this, but there's ways around it. One thing that the original algorithm did was it adds, you know, not only you you have a link, it sort of adds a tiny, tiny weighted link from any page to any page. So if you think of a random walker. You know, like a crawler, right? You, you, because you can look at these scores as some kind of, of probabilities of a random walker or a crawler being at a page, right? Because if you're at a page and you have three links going out, then the probability of being in which one of the other pages afterwards is exactly a third times the probability were where you were plus this for all the nodes, right? So the equation looks a lot like this. It would be like x per time t, and it's x per time t plus one, right? And these are the Markov processes and so on. Now, one thing you can do to take away this issue is just say, well, I'm going to add a link from any page to any page and just make it really, really weak. Right? So you create these like, very weak hyperlinks that every page connects to every page just to avoid problems of this type. Okay? Now, another problem that might arise, and this maybe is not as easy to see, but we'll see it when we talk about diffusion maps and random walks on graphs, is if the web looks a little different. Right? So a very strange web in which you have web one and web two again, and now you have nodes pages here, and now web only connects like this. Right? Web one, two pages in the web one never connect to each other, two pages in web two also never connect to each other. Right? Now this has, a, has another issue, which is that 
you know, if you think of these, there's, a, there's a, as we'll see, there's another interpretation of these in terms of probabilities and limiting probabilities of, of random walkers. And here there's the issue that if you start on web one, say after an odd number of steps, you're always on web two, and after an even number of steps, you're always on web one. And this will correspond to, <coughs> to there being no limit in, in a certain sense, right? And, and as we'll see later, this will correspond to, a, to an eigenvalue of minus one in some of these matrices, right? And this will be also an issue. Now this issue is of course also resolved with the same one, the same solution as before. Another thing is that you can just make, make every page have a link to itself, right? And this, this is called a lazy random walk. And I realize that we're not talking about random walks because we're not talking yet about graphs, but I just want to, to mention these things for when we talk later about random walks, this will sort of come back. Now provided that you know, there's no issues like this, then indeed there's only one solution. We'll see that later. And this solution is the scores for page rank. Right? So this, this will be the scores for page rank. Right? Now, now, of course, the question is how do we compute this? Right? So this is a huge, huge matrix. Right? It's number of pages by number of pages on the internet. The internet is humongous. How do we, how do we compute this? So, one way that, of course, if you take the eigenvectors of the matrix, you know, this is not, you know, it sticks like cubic time. It, uh, in general, if you want to compute all the eigenvectors, but since you know that this is the leading eigenvector, you can do it via the power method. Right? Again, the power method, I'm sure you've seen it in the algebra, it's much easier to see why it works in symmetric matrices. But uh, yeah, so here I won't explain why it works, but I assume you've seen it in the algebra, otherwise, you know search about power method, but you can use the power method. All right, so what does that mean? It means you start with some vector, say V0, and then you compute, you know, each step, you compute the next step VK by hitting the matrix P times the vector in the step VK minus one. I can normalize them in some way. Okay. And now, Right, and this will converge, provided that no issues of the, of the type that were here exist. This will converge to the page rank, uh, right, for nice, uh, for nice, and they don't need to be so nice. And B, this will converge to the solution X, like the page rank solution. Right, now this is a very nice thing from the algorithm viewpoint for the search engine, which is that, you know, this is a big, big matrix. Right? So if you figure out how to hit this matrix against the vector, all you have to do is that operation over and over again. Right? And now let's say that you, you know, this is a big, big matrix. Maybe you have some very sophisticated way of doing this, but still takes you a week. Right? So you start with some, you know, just V0 or something. It takes you a week to compute better, slightly, you know, some better approximation. And then another week, another week. After 10 weeks, you have a pretty good approximation. But by this point, maybe the internet has changed, right? New, better pages showed up and so on. The point is that now, if you want to recompute the scores, probably the internet didn't change so much. Therefore, the scores probably also did not change so much either. And so the, the, the solution of the scores for the old internet, you know, the internet from yesterday, are probably pretty close to the one from the internet for today. And so what you could do is simply, instead of start with V0, start with the scores for the internet of last week. And so in fact, the algorithm that's actually used, and was used, is that you, maybe every week, I mean, I don't know if that's the right time, I don't know if that's the right time, I'm sure it's not, but it's probably in that scale. You just say every week, you take this, the current scores and hit it against this matrix B that your web crawlers gave you, and now compute new scores, implement that on your search engine, and every week update your scores by just one linear author operation of matrix vector product. Okay, and this is essentially page rank. Right, there's paper, there's many papers talking about this. There's the original paper you know, of, uh, of the people who invented Google, one of which is called Page, right? Larry Page uh, who, who wrote about this algorithm. And, uh, and, and, and then there's many, many other articles, you know, describing the algorithm or sort of from a didactic, didactic viewpoint or, or, uh, or extending it and so on. And they call it, you know, like, the million dollar algorithm, the eigenvector, the billion dollar eigenvector, the song, you, you can almost yeah, keep track of how much Google is worth by, by the titles of such papers. 
I think by now it's probably worth it's, it's probably a much much higher number for the for how much this the second vector is worth. So so now you know I I just want to finish by giving you a little bit of the abstraction of graphs, right? So very much graphs are already in the back, but but now we're going to just going to abstract a little a little on graphs, and then in the, in the next lecture we'll talk about clustering and spectral clustering and so on and so forth. All right, so just uh, the, the definitions and abstraction of graphs. So graph is an object that will have vertices and edges, right? It's it nodes or vertices, and they are connected, right? So these are vertices, these are edges, right? Sometimes they're called nodes, and these are called links, right? Like the hyperlinks. Sometimes it's directed, sometimes it's indirected. Directed or indirected. Right, so the web, the page rank in the web is a directed graph, right? Just because page i is a link to page j does not mean that page j links back. Right, so this was directed, but actually most of what we're going to deal with in the course are indirected. This was one of the very few instances in which we talked about directed graphs. Right, most of the time we will talk about indirected graphs, and then I mean, there's, you know, my, the graph might have weights, you know, where wij is maybe you know the weight of edge ij. Right, you can have weights. Then there's many many definitions that are important, and we're going to use right. G is connected. If for all you know, i and j nodes, uh, nodes there is a path between them. All right, the degree of i is going to be the number of nodes connected to i. Right, and if it's if it's weighted, uh, you can just Say that the degree of i is the sum of wij, j over all vertices, and you can think of wij as just zero if there's no edge, or you can say summing over all j such that ij is not is, is an edge. We're going to say that a set s, a subset s of the nodes is a click, and all these things are in the lecture notes, right? Is a click if for all i and j, sorry, for all i and j in S, we have that i j is an edge. And, you know, sort of dually is going to be an independent set if exactly the opposite is true. Independent set. If for all i and j in S, i j is not an edge. Right? It's like a an, an click for the complement graph, the graph where every edge becomes an edge and every non edge becomes an edge. Right? Now, next, you know, in the next lecture, we're going to talk a lot more about graphs and how to cluster graphs, how to learn in graphs, and so on. But one thing that I want to say already now is that I think it's one of the most, one of the take home messages, actually, even from the course, is that. Spectral properties of matrices are going to say something about the geometry of graphs, and they're going to be very useful to understand the geometry of graphs. In a way that linear algebra tells you something about the geometry of objects like this. And I think the first time you see this is sort of surprising. Right? But through page rank, I think you can already see it. At least you can see that if you have a graph, then the importance of a node is this can be described via some eigenvalue, eigenvector calculation. But moreover, even more, remember when we saw these obstructions, right? The, there was the obstruction that if we had a web that was disconnected, right? Then there was an issue that there were two solutions to that equation, right? So there was a matrix that we built out of the graph that one of its eigenvalues started having higher multiplicity. So what this is suggesting is that looking at, say, the multiplicity of this eigenvalue for this matrix, tells you whether the graph is connected or not. So it's appearing that you know, a graph being connected or not, which is very much like a topological property of the graph, can be read off on the spectrum of certain matrices that you build out of the graph. It also seems that this sort of strange web 
one that only connected to two and vice versa, right? A bipartite graph also had some special spec uh, uh, spectral properties. And indeed, this will be the case. We'll see this in the next lecture. But let me just say that for those of you that have heard or, or heard the word or seen or know the algorithm of spectral clustering, it's exactly this, right? Because if you want to cluster a graph through some kind of very simple unsupervised learning on a graph, you want to cluster it, then what this is saying is if the graph was like, you know, already clustered for you, was already disconnected, then you could read off this on the spectrum of the matrix. Now, spectral clustering is going to say, well, maybe it's not completely disconnected, but maybe it's almost as disconnected, and I can still go look in the spectrum of a matrix and find how it's almost disconnected. And this will be exactly spectral clustering. As we'll see at the next lecture or the one after, this will be exactly spectral, spectral clustering. Right? Thank you.